Well, good morning. You know, it's strange. I'm up here almost every Sunday, and I never get nervous standing there. But there's something about what, four feet away that's got me real nervous. Well, I will say Happy New Year's. Um, 2023, it doesn't seem like that's right. I feel like I'm saying it wrong. The year 2023. But how many of you guys have ever done a New Year's resolution? Put your hands up. Okay, now keep your hands up if you lasted longer than two weeks. A few hands went down. How about a month? More hands went down. How about the full year? You lasted the full year. Awesome. You can put your hands down. That has nothing to do with what we're going to talk about this morning. <laughs> but it, it is funny. This time of year, people um, are coming out of the Christmas mindset and going into one that's focusing on the upcoming year, and that New Year's resolution mentality, and I'm going to change something next year to make it better than it was this year, it seems to be pretty prevalent in our culture. Um, so my, my goal and my hope this morning is to urge you to make 2023 a year of repentance, to make continual repentance a regular part of your life, a regular part of your devotion, a regular part of your family's life, and in turn, make this church here a repentant people. Because we all sin every day, every hour, every single one of us. There's not one in here that doesn't. And our sin nature wants us to keep sinning, to give in to the flesh rather than the Father. The second London Confession says this, talking about our sin nature. It says, this corruption of nature during this life doth remain in those that are regenerated, and although it be through Christ pardoned and mortified, yet both itself and the first motions thereof are truly and properly sin. Now, we'll take that out of 17th century English. Uh, you are cursed from the sin of Adam. And if you're a Christian, Christ's blood has covered and paid for your sin, but your very being is still not good. And since this is true, how do we as Christians pursue being models of our Savior? Because Jesus lived a perfect life, and we can't be perfect. Is there a way for us to model him and turn from sin and be pure and holy? The person uh, that you can blame for me being up here is Bobby. Where's Bobby Miller? Hey, Bobby. Um, so if this bombs, you can blame him later. Um, Bobby gave me a book by Thomas Watson uh, called The Doctrine of Repentance. It's a really small book, like 100, 125 pages, and um, it's a little Puritan paperback. And, and I began reading it, and as I did, a question just kept brewing in my mind. Um, what role should repentance play in my life? And I remember I was almost done with the book, <clears throat> and so I texted AJ and I said, hey man, uh, we need to have a crucial question sermon on repentance. And uh, his response was, uh, great, when are you gonna preach it? And uh, I'll be honest, my intention was someone else preaching it. Um, but lo and behold, here I am in front of you with this cute boy band mic. Um, and as I pondered on the doctrine of repentance, I had to get to the root of the doctrine. What is repentance? See, it, it's become a churchy word. We've, if you've been in the church for a long time, you've probably heard it a dozen times a week. And the word seems to just become a part of our logo or lingo and our jargon. But do we really know what it means? Do we really know how to repent? How to work towards having a contrite heart? one that is quick to repent. When you think of the word repent, the thoughts that might come to your mind might be street preachers yelling, telling everyone to repent. Or maybe you're weird like me and you think of a well put together televangelist in a three piece suit and hair that stands this high, just telling people the end was near and they needed to repent. But what is repentance? I can tell you what repentance is not. Repentance is not, oops, I sinned, sorry God, I'll do better next time. And it's not, oh, my bad, you already forgave me, so I'll just try to avoid it next time. 
And I know AJ has referenced it many times, but gotquestions.org defines repentance as this, a change of mind that results in a change of action. A change of mind that results in a change of action. And sometimes when we think of repentance, we only think of confession. If I confess the sin, all will be forgiven and I can move on. But in reality, confession is just one part of the repentance. See, repentance is the entire process from the mind change, the heart change toward the sin to the actual turning from the sin. Turning from it and running in the other direction. For example, if I, if I lied to Nicole, my wife, and repentance wouldn't be me telling her, I lied to you, and just moving on and, and never talking about it again. It would be recognizing what I did and being specific and seeking forgiveness from her and changing my actions to not commit the sin again. Repentance is a gift from God, a gift of grace that if understood correctly will help us turn from sin and look to him. I did not mean for that to rhyme. Um, I do want to say that there are a couple different types of repentance, if you will. You have repentance upon faith and then continued or continual repentance. And you must have both to be a follower of Christ. Repentance upon faith or repentance upon regeneration is the type of repentance that we find Jesus proclaiming in Galilee in Mark 1.15. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe in the gospel. And that initial repentance that we have, it's recognizing that we are broken sinners in need of a Savior, confessing that need of a Savior, and placing our trust in Him who is Christ. But here's the thing, from the oldest Christian in this room to the youngest, whether you've been a believer for 20 minutes or 20 years, that proclamation that Jesus stated, it still rings true for you. Repent and believe in the good news. Repent and believe the gospel. Repentance is a way that we can continue to believe the gospel every single day. We believe that our sins have already been forgiven, and so we will not dwell on them. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and go with me to Romans chapter 6. We're going to read verses 1 to 7. If you don't have a Bible and you want one, there's some on the tables back there. Go grab one. Who doesn't like free stuff? Verses 1 to 7 says this. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Let me pray for us real quick. God, you are so good. God, your gifts are better than anything we can have here on earth. Lord, thank you for giving us the ability to repent to turn from our sins. Lord, thank you for your son's sacrifice and for the blood, the forgiveness of sins. Lord, as we enter 2023, I pray that we would be a repentant people. God, that we turn our eyes and our hearts and our souls to you and who you are and the goodness that you are. Lord, you are so kind to us. And we love you, and we thank you. It's in your precious name that we pray. Amen. 
Now, right before the section that we just read, uh, Paul told the Romans, the Christians there, the free gift that a follower of Jesus could have. And as chapter 6 begins, he shares a warning that addresses what could be a huge misunderstanding and lead to a majorly incorrect view of God. Go back a chapter with me and look at verses 20 and 21 of chapter 5. It says, Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul is saying a lot in that chapter before this one, but one of the things he's saying is that you cannot out the grace of God. Under the old law, there was no hope, but we can hope in the righteousness that we have from Christ. He's saying there is no sin a believer, past, present, or future, could commit that the grace of the Lord can't cover. He's saying that grace is not a, a one-to-one ratio, grace to sin. It's not where one sin there is, one little bit of grace is, but rather where sin is, grace exceeds by a mile. And if we believe this, that this grace covers our sin no matter what, if we're a believer, wouldn't the next logical thought, especially for the early Christians and and even for us today, be if, if where sin increases, grace abounds all the more, shouldn't we just sin all that we want so God's grace can be even more abundant? If I sin this much and God's grace increases this much, shouldn't I just keep sinning as much as I want so God's grace can be magnified? What does Paul say? What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? When we are truly united with Christ... There are specific effects that are produced in and through us. The first being, we grow to hate sin more and more. We grow to hate sin more and more. So are we to continue in sin so God's grace can cover it and be more prevalent? Paul's answer in the the ESV translated to say, by no means. Can't we just keep sinning and let God's grace do its job? The translation that a lot of theologians and pastors use in this case is the American Standard Version, and I think it encapsulates what it's saying pretty well. It says, God forbid. God forbid. Paul quickly squashes that idea that we should sin more to make God's grace more abundant. And if the end of that verse isn't enough proof, he goes on to say, how can we who died to sin still live in it? How is it possible? If you're a believer here this morning, you have already died to sin. This means that by divine grace, God has taken away sin's reign on your life. It's not that you'll now no longer sin or that sin won't be tempting. It's that you have something so much sweeter and so much better than the temporal pleasure that committing a sin might bring. For those of you who like sports, you probably have your favorite teams, right? Anyone like sports? Okay, one person likes sports, so that's good. (laughs) You'll get this analogy. Um, You probably have your favorite team or your favorite teams and your favorite sports. And... Those favorite teams probably have rivals. I say probably because almost everyone has rivals. And when you really start to follow a team and to give in to loving them, as long as it's not the Braves, the disdain you feel towards your team's rivalries grows more and more as you put your loyalties with your team. Now, I I went to WVU and I graduated from WVU. Let's go Mountaineers. And honestly, before I went there, I didn't really care about the Pitt and WVU rivalry. Um, But if you've ever been to a WVU game, it's hard to uh, not hear about the Pitt and WVU rivalry. 
But as I began diving into the sports culture there and attending football games and baseball games and basketball games, I remember just at, in the, out of nowhere, I, I felt this hatred toward Pitt. And, and really, I can't explain it. Like I, I, I had never been on the campus. I knew nothing about it. I'd never even been to a Pitt game. So, but for some reason, no matter who we were playing, WVU hates Pitt. And what time is it? Pitt still sucks. <laughs> so had I not dove into the culture and went to the games and enjoyed being surrounded by people who had the similar likes to me, I probably would have continued to not care about that rivalry. And honestly, I probably would have just still kind of followed WVU sports without caring about any of their rivals. But just as I started caring about the sports at WVU because of my attendance and my involvement, it's the same for us. The more we pursue Christ and unity with him, the goodness of God will outshine the temptation of sin. We will grow to hate sin more and more. And as we grow to hate sin more and more, we'll also see that the fruit of our lives changes. Look at verses 3 through 5 again. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We too might walk in newness of life. Now Paul talks about baptism here. And he's not solely talking about the symbolic baptism that we see in that over there, but rather what the act represents. That we were spiritually baptized into Christ, into his death, and that we were also raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, that we might walk in newness of life. Scripture says that before God gifted us salvation, we were dead in our trespasses. Without the spiritual baptism, we were rotting corpses. But then we were given newness of life. What a phrase. In the original Greek, Paul uses the word kainates. Can everyone say kainates? Yeah, it's a fancy word. Now you learn Greek. And this word literally just means newness. It means a 180 degree shift. It's not just, oh, it's a little different when you become a Christian. It's that the old is gone and what is there is entirely and completely new newness of life. It isn't telling us that life is all smooth sailing now. The newness we have doesn't come from materialistic items or physical gain, but it comes from pursuing holiness. As we pursue Christ and his ways, we begin to detest and despise sin. And now the things that brought us pleasure that were sinful have lost their appeal. We turn our minds and our hearts to God's word and to learn and grow and love him and his ways more. Christian, our joy and our delight comes from the Lord, and we worship him through our words and our deeds. Now, imagine I have two five-gallon buckets up here, and as Nicole runs away, I'll say this quickly. If you ask her, I absolutely love five-gallon buckets. Like, if it was up to me, I would own like 400 of them. Also unrelated to anything. Um, but say I walk over to this bucket over here, and I take two two liters of Dr. Pepper, and I pour it in the bucket. And I pick up the bucket. No one's in the front row, so I'll throw it as far as I can. And I throw it. What comes out of the bucket? Dr. Pepper. If you said something else, I'd be worried. I come to the same bucket over here, and I dump two one-gallon jugs of water in the bucket, and I pick up the bucket, and I throw it. What comes out of the bucket? Water. Good. The same is true for me and for you. 
we pour out what we're pouring in. If we are dwelling in sin, holiness is not going to radiate out of us. Rather, when we dwell in the Word, in prayer, in Christian fellowship, and the many other things that God has graciously given us that are good and holy, we will pour out Christ-like love, grace, and the countless attributes of God. When we were buried with Christ and raised in the likeness of his death, the old man was washed away. The new person is Christ's, filled with the Holy Spirit. At the moment of my regeneration, I went from being Garrett Shepherd dead in sin to Garrett Shepherd alive in Christ. And how beautiful is that? You went from lost to found, from stranger to child. You have been chosen by God to serve him in all things and to worship him in all things. So you can't love God and pour out sinful hate. You can't serve God and refuse to make time for Him. You can't worship Him and worship yourself. This is the newness of life. And with that newness that comes from being united with Christ, we hate sin more and more. The fruit of our lives changes, and ultimately, obedience becomes our delight. Obedience becomes our delight. It becomes a desire rather than a duty. Look at uh, verses 6 and 7 again. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. If you're a Christian, you are no longer a slave to sin. You have been set free, even from that sin that you can't seem to kick. Anger, lust, jealousy, addiction, selfishness, no matter what it is, Paul says you are not a slave to it. You are a slave to righteousness. That sin is not your master. The pleasure you feel from that sin is not your king. The maker of the heavens and the earth is your master. Christ, who was born a lowly babe here on earth and died a death that you or I could hardly fathom, is your king. Paul says in verse 6 that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. And the body of sin that he's talking about here is our dead, unregenerate, sinful body. The one that is an enemy of God. He says it would be brought to nothing so that sin would not and cannot enslave us. Have you ever heard the phrase, it's an acquired taste? Now, typically when people say that, they're saying that about art or coffee or that nasty cheese that smells like dirty socks. And a lot of times this case is the truth. If you, if this case is true. I can't words. A lot, of, a lot of times this is true. I know when I was a kid, my, uh, my momma would uh, give us kids coffee. And I say coffee because it was about 98% milk and maybe a tablespoon of coffee. And I'll be honest, at first, I absolutely hated it. But I remember I wanted to be like the adults. They would sit down and have their coffee, and I wanted to be like them. And so I would sit, and I would have my coffee. And we used to ask for it all the time, my sister and my cousins. And when I started to get a little older, that milk to coffee ratio began to change. And I went from 98% milk to 50% to 25% to now I'll drink a black coffee. So at first, obedience might feel like a chore. It might feel like a to-do list. But just like the coffee or the art or the stinky cheese, 
enjoyment comes with time. It comes with being familiar with it. Whether we're talking about practical obedience, our devotion, our scripture reading, our prayer, or our obedience to abstain from sin, it's not easy at first. And listen, no two people are alike. What works for me might not work for you. I know for me, reading scripture at bedtime lasts about 25 seconds. I got a head nod from my wife, so I think that's right. Um, 25 seconds and I'm out cold. While other people, they thrive at doing their devotions at night. The sins that I gravitate towards are more than likely not exactly what you would, but you will start to despise those sins. You will see the fruit of your life change. What might feel or seem like tedious obedience will become delightful obedience. These three effects are interwoven into each other, and they do boil down to one sentence, the big idea. You cannot walk with Jesus and continue to walk in sin. You cannot walk with Jesus and continue to walk in sin. Jesus and sin don't mix. He has been from eternity past sinless. He was sinless on the earth, sinless in heaven, and will be sinless forever and ever and ever. You can't have a little bit of sin and a little bit of Jesus. But maybe you're like me and, and you're one good justifier, because I am. I'll tell myself, I'm only doing this because of that, or I'm, I didn't do that because of this. But you can't have it both ways. You either turn away from sin or you turn away from God. There is no middle ground. Maybe you have that sin in your life today that you need to seek repentance for. Earlier I asked a question, is there a way for us to turn from sin and pursue holiness? The answer is yes. It doesn't always feel like the answer is yes. Some seasons of life feel like sin has won. But sin and death have been defeated. Not by you, not by me, not by AJ, not by the church at Martinsburg, but by Jesus Christ. What role does repentance play in a Christian's life? As we grow in our faith, repentance should be a natural part of our relationship with God. Because we begin to hate sin, our actions and our thoughts change, and we're obedient out of joy rather than obligation. So when we do fall short, we're not doomed. Don't get me wrong, we should take sin very, very seriously. But we also need to remember that we will still do it. And we have a God who is there to listen and to help us recognize the sin within us and to help us make a change. We have a church of fellow believers here to help us repent, to help hold us accountable, to help put things in place to help us avoid sin. But before we can repent, we have to recognize the sin. Church, are you willing to lovingly point out the sin in your fellow church member's life? Group leaders, are you willing to call out sin when you see it from one of your group members? Ministry team leaders, how about you? But most importantly, believers, are you willing to look inward? I'm going to ask the, the band to come up, but before we sing, I would hope that you would consider praying Psalm 139, where it says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. I'll end the only way I know how to. It's by saying this. Repent and believe in the good news. No matter where your walk with God is, repent and believe 
the gospel. Even if the walk is non-existent and you're not walking with the Lord, or even if your walk is going better than it ever has, repent and believe the gospel. 